once again Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world even more particularly to all shepherds rod believers and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America special greetings to our brethren in Colorado in Kansas in Georgia in Missouri in Texas Chicago Illinois Arkansas California and New York and also to our brethren in Canada in Fiji Island Mexico Spain and Africa Kenya Zambia Pakistan to the United Kingdom to our brethren in Australia and to our brethren in Malaysia and to the rest of the 144,000 living saints scattered abroad greetings may the good lord bless you brothers and sisters this is our special episode number 12 and This is a final warning message just prior to the close of provision for the church. And at this time, let's focus our attention to the first paragraph in 2SR page 164. But before reading um, 2SR 164, I would like to read first track number 5, 6. Track number 5 on page 6, it says, So before a person can climb the ladder of truth, he must first of all free himself from erroneous theories which keep him bound in darkness and to lose himself from such weights of error so as to reach the, stop, the top step of the ladder of truth. He must carefully investigate and prove all things in open-mindedness. Track number 5 on page 6. So, here in Answerer number 1, page 8, it says, In view of these solemn realities, even now lo- looming before our eyes, no longer, brother, sister, hide yourself in the darkness. Stand in the light, lest you stumble and fall and not be found. Come, take time, and let us reason together. And, of course, our reasoning, all explanation, must be strictly confined only to in the golden bowl and to us are page 289 it says find your explanation in the bowl and you will have no trouble in knowing the truth or of avoiding the ever ready trap of deception thus the difficulty in knowing the difference between truth and error is eliminated so at this time brothers and sisters i would like to read track number seven on page five saying believing that most of you will before helping the one side or the other fire its guns do as did natanael john chapter 1 verse 45 to 51 follow the example which the lord has set before us and respond to duty's challenge to investigate to come and see we trust that you will in the ensuing pages give unbiased consideration to the facts set forth so to all who are listening hoping that they will give unbiased consideration to all the facts set forth in this study. Now, let us read uh, 2SR 164. 2SR page 164. It says, He who fails to respond to the heavenly summons will be left without the seal or covering of God and therefore must be cut off from among his people as prefigured by the services in the typical day of atonement. Now, here, brothers and sisters, the, the statement is very plain that those who fail to respond to the heavenly summons will be left without the seal or covering of God. And therefore, they must be cut off from among his people as prefigured by the services in the typical day of atonement. Now, first of all, we need to define the word summons. The word summons, it is a noun. It is a letter issued by the presiding judge at chamber to someone of being allegedly accused of committing such, an, such a crime or offense. And he is invited or ordered by the court to appear on the court. On the earthly tribunal, if you will neglect or reject such summons, you will be charged by the court as contempt of the court. And after such rejection, the, the judge will issue warrant of arrest because you denied the summons issued by the presiding judge. Now, this one is called heavenly 
summons coming from, of course, God the Father, the presiding judge in the most holy place. Now, I would like to read the statement on an Adventist Activities Research Committee, page 15. It says, And how will he judge the living without a message declaring that their cases are now to appear before God? And then it says, And how will we know when it comes if we keep our eyes and ears closed? If we do not change our present state of mind, how shall we believe even if we should accidentally hear that the message is come? Then he says, Would the judge of heaven condemn one without trial? And how shall he judge him without summons? I think that reading uh, is easy to understand. That in this study, the heavenly summons is issued only during the judgment that pertains to the living. That statement in 2 TG number 12, page 30, saying to the people who must know that their cases are on trial, that statement is applied only to the living. Because at the time when the proceedings that pertains to the dead is on trial, such people that had been on trial on the heavenly sanctuary are lying unconscious in their graves. According to answerer number 3 on page 6, it says, it is evident, answer number 3, page 6, it is evident that the investigative judgment of the dead affects only the heavenly sanctuary. This is doubly evident when it is remembered that the dead know not anything but are lying unconscious while waiting in their graves for the resurrection day. Lying unconscious in their graves. And in the general conference special, the statement used by the shepherds had plainly told us that when the proceedings that pertains to the dead in general conference special page 24 it says it removes only their names because their bodies are non existent so at the time when the proceedings that pertains to the dead is going on in the heavenly sanctuary the people that had been on trial their bodies are no longer in existence lying unconscious in their graves. And that is the reason why the shepherds are declared clearly that the judgment that pertains to the living is even more important. According to Jezreel letter number 2 on page page 2. Let's read. It says, Now since the message of the judgment for the living is of far greater importance than the message of the judgment for the dead, it is but expected that the Bible will have more to say about the latter than the former. This is so because the judgment for the living has to do with the living themselves, with the message bearers rather than with the dead. In importance, therefore, there is no comparison between the two. But the question says, how will we get the message of the judgment for the living? The answer is clear to all. We will get it in the same way we got the one in 1844. Since it then came through inspiration and through God's own chosen instrumentality, it is certain that the additional message, early writings, page 277, too, is to come in the same way, that is, by inspiration through God's own chosen agency. Indeed, truth is never revealed in any other way but by inspiration. Jezreel letter number 2 on page, on page 2. Now, first of all, brothers and sisters, there is no other... Um, message that directly pointing to the judgment that is revelation 14 verse 6 and verse 7 which we call the first angels message it is the first angels message and it's very important to understand it completely now in one is our 156 it says one is our page 156 note the verb come is in present tense, just as in Revelation 14 verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. We as a people hold that the verb come was inscribed in present tense because the judgment in heaven took place at the end of the 2300 days of Daniel's prophecy in 1844, but it was not understood until after the prophetic period had passed. Therefore, God did not intend to make the judgment known until after the hour had come. For this reason, inspiration inscribed the occurrence in present tense is come in order to be grammatically correct. So that is very plain, brothers and sisters. One is our page 156 and 157. That since the scripture is inscribed in present tense, God had no intention to make the judgment known.
before the actual time has actually come. Otherwise, such revelation would be grammatically incorrect. Now, Bithyhotep died before the event. He himself declared clearly in track number 3 on page 43. Track number 3 on page 43, it says, As the cleansings called for in the parables and in Malachi's prophecy have never taken place, the investigative judgment of the living is obviously then yet future. And that was in 1934 when he declared that the judgment of the living is still future in the days of Bithyhotep. And in answerer number 2, And that was in 1944. Let's read. Answerer number 2 on page 93. It says, Although we are still in the time of the judgment of the dead. Answerer number 2, page 93. And the testimony of the prophet made it so plain that he has no knowledge. When the judgment that pertains to the dead will close and when the judgment that pertains to the living will begin. Either exact or approximate. Here in answerer number 1, page 94. It says, in the, st- in the statement in question, the rod has no reference to the investigative judgment. The message sits no date, either exact or approximate, for the closing of the judgment of the dead or for the beginning of the judgment of the living. So it was guaranteed by the prophet that Bithyhotep did not set any date. When the judgment that pertains to the dead will close and when the judgment that pertains to the living will commence. He has no knowledge concerning about it, either exact or approximate. Why? Because such knowledge cometh only from God. And God has no intention to make the judgment known before the actual time had come. Otherwise, such revelation would be grammatically incorrect. But the prophet himself declared in 2SR 164, Let's read again the statement. It says, But when our high priest shall begin the atonement for the living, so this atonement is for the living, no longer for the dead. To SR 164, it says, But when our high priest shall begin the atonement for the living, There must be a message of present truth. The statement, there must be a message of present truth. Plainly indicating that Jesus Christ will not begin the atonement for the living without sending the message of present truth. In 11 Zimbabwe Code number 3, page 5, it says, Present truth comes only from God. So the statement, but when our high priest shall begin the atonement for the living, there must be a message of present truth. That present truth is intended to the living. Brethren, the entire generation from creation down to the general cause of provision was divided into seven periods illustrated by the seven seals. And each seal, there must be definite and specific present truth. And accordingly, the seventh here in uh, 2SR page 202, but the seventh sealing period being the last must concern the living. So the present truth under the seventh seal is addressed to the living, addressed to the saints that will no longer to taste death. Bithyhotep, of course, expected to be among the living saints, but we know he died. Not only Bithyhotep, as well as Sister White, both of them expected to be among the living saints. But the statement in answerer number 5, page 89, saying, since she died, she could not be a part of the 144,000. The same with Bithyhotep. But 100%, God know it beforehand that Bithyhotep will die. And there is no reason for God that he will bestow the present truth under the seventh seal. By which that present truth is concerned only the living. In 1SR page 28, it says, According to these scriptures, we are plainly stated, we must conclude that the saints of God are sealed with present truth in all ages. And whatever that present truth is, that is the seal. And since the seventh period is a sealing period, there must be present truth under the seventh seal. In 2SR 215, it says, As the six seals have reference to six periods in which the saints were sealed, the seventh must also apply to a sealing period. Otherwise, it cannot be called seventh seal. 2SR 215. Therefore, the seventh sealing period, there must be present truth. And that present truth, brothers and sisters, is what decides our eternal destiny. And here, to SR 164, it says, But when our high priest shall begin the atonement for the living, there must be a message of present truth, sounding of the trumpet, urging everyone to lay hold on the Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ, by which only can he in figure come to the sanctuary. 
confess his sin and secure his life. Unless the close of the judgment for the dead and the commencement for the living be made known to us, we would have no present truth while the judgment for the living is in session. Neither would such judgment be legal or just. He who fails to respond to the heavenly summons will be left without the seal or covering of God and therefore must be cut off from among his people as prefigured by the services in the typical day of atonement. We need to sincerely study 2SR-164 and honestly grasp the true meaning of what the word of inspiration is saying. Because if we will twist, we are only working against our own eternal welfare. Without any doubt, if you will only study 2SR-164, you can understand that the heavenly summon, that is a message that informs us that the judgment that pertains to the dead is closed and the judgment that pertains to the living is in progress. The statement is this, unless the close of the judgment for the dead and the commencement for the living be made known to us, we would have no present truth. While the judgment for the living is in session. And then it says, neither would such judgment be legal or just. And God is a God of justice. How could it be such judgment is illegal and unjust? No justice at all. That is what a statement in an Adventist Activities Research Committee saying, Would the judge of heaven condemn one without trial? And how shall he judge without presenting summons? There must be heavenly summons. But the fact is that if you fail to respond to the heavenly summons, you will be left without the seal or covering of God and therefore must be cut off. According to this reading, it can easily be understood that the heavenly summons is served during provisionary time by which there is still a chance to be sealed. Of course, only those who respond to the heavenly summons because there are only two classes of people in that reading. Those who fail to respond and those who responded to the heavenly summons. What is the message of the heavenly summons? Come to the sanctuary, confess your sin to secure your life. Why is it that inspiration inscribe it in singular form? Brothers and sisters, to confess our sin, there must be a specific sin by which we need to confess. I would like to read first to us our page 219. It says, while the judgment for the living is in progress, every sin must be confessed and put away. He who would neglect this great privilege will find himself involved in everlasting ruin, cut off from among his people. Ignoring this most vital subject would not profit us in the least. But in what way that you will know that the judgment for the living is already in progress? That is the question. That is why it is a life and death matter. Saying, well, the judgment for the living is in progress. But the question, in what way that you will be able to ascertain that the judgment for the living is in progress? That the judgment that pertains to the living is in session? Now let us read 2TG number 12 on page 29. 2TG number 12, page 29. It says, The only difference, you see, is that Daniel was shown the judgment being set up, whereas John saw it in full session. The revelation, moreover, in the following verses, again and again, endeavors to make us see that the event there portrayed is the judgment in session. You see, Revelation 14, verse 7, the event portrayed in that verse, the judgment is in session saying fear God and give glory to him for the hour of judgment is come and I saw thrones John declares and judgment was given unto them Revelation 20 verse 4 then it says John truly paid it as a prophecy but when it actually takes place then God's agency on earth there must be agency of God on earth what is that agency of God the spirit of prophecy in the church is to proclaim that the event has actually taken place how do we define the spirit of prophecy? Ponder deeply, brothers and sisters. Did B.T. Hotha proclaim that the judgment for the living has actually taken place in his days? It is quite opposite. Contrarywise, he himself declared the judgment that pertains to the living still future. Track number 3, page 43. 
And he himself testified in answerer number 2, page 93. We are still in the time of the judgment of the dead. We need to base our faith with absolute fact, not by assumption. Brothers and sisters, what is the statement in Jezreel letter number 2, page 2? How will we get the message in the judgment that pertains to the living? We will get it in the same way. We got the one in 1844. There are two inspired messengers that God raised in the judgment that pertains to the dead. William Miller and Sister White. If we will get it in the same way, in the judgment that pertains to the living, therefore, there must be two divine inspired messengers that God would raise. And I do fully believe that that must be antitypical Elijah John the Baptist, which is B.T. Hodder, and then antitypical Elijah that is back. Because there is no other promised prophet as recorded in General Conference Spatial on page 39. I would like to read General Conference Spatial, page 39. It says, In fact, the three angels' messages are applicable to the judgment for the dead only indirectly. For the judgment for the living is the all-important event. That is, the angel is not sent particularly to explain what the judgment does to the dead, but what it is to do to the living. Then it says, so we see that the more we consider the subject, the more obvious becomes the truth that the third angel's message in its final phase is the judgment for the living, the harvest. Plainly then, the work of Elijah is to give light on the judgment for the living. Bithi Hotep had been raised by God to explain what is the judgment that pertains to the living. But to announce the commencement of the judgment for the living, it was never been bestowed by God unto him due to the fact that he died before its commencement. And he himself, the prophet himself says that God has no intention to make the judgment known before the actual time had come. We know that there are many false expectations of the prophet. Now, brothers and sisters, we need to seriously study this subject before everything is too late. While there is still a chance that Jesus Christ could listen to us. You know, in this subject, if we could be able only to understand the plan of redemption, we can really appreciate God's goodness, the loving kindness of God. Now, I would like to introduce to you all the statements given in the Shepherd's Rod publications concerning the judicial proceedings that took place in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, let me read to you the statement in track number 15. It says, track number 15, page 13. Both seers distinctly declare that the event which they saw was the judgment. The difference between the two scenes is that Daniel was led to look into the sanctuary while preparations were being made for the judgment to convene. Whereas John was led to look into the sanctuary after the judgment had been set up. In fact, John not only saw the judgment in progress, but he saw the whole proceeding from start to finish. Do we believe this statement? That John the Revelator, in his vision in the island of Patmos, God revealed to him the whole proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary from start to finish. In 2TG 24, page 23, it says, let us, let us be God's real people, logical thinkers, and not bait hunters. Honestly, brothers and sisters, would you think such proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary will be revealed by God to his people? after the proceedings are completely finished, that God would rebuild the entire proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary after the time by which there is no more chance for us to accept the message because probation closed, it would be illogical. And that's why I do fully believe that this reading in track number 2 on page 12 can be applied to the entire Bible. Saying, never has this symbolical prophecy been understood by any people and never could it have been fulfilled and not been rebuilt. That is the character of God. God will not allow that such prophecy will be fulfilled without first revealing the importance of such prophecy. Then for what purpose they, ha they have been written? I remember the statement in answerer number 2 on page 75. It says here, these prophecies must therefore be rebuilt in order to strengthen the church in her final warfare. Otherwise, for what purpose were they written? 
The prophecies must be rebuilt. And the voice of inspiration says here in 2 TG number 12, page 30. 2 TG number 12, page 30. The revelation, therefore, is to be more fully understood during the judgment of the living. That is the promise. The statement, it will be more fully understood when in the period of the judgment that pertains to the living. And B.T. Hotep died in the period of the judgment. That pertains to the dead. But the promise was. The book of Revelation. Will be more fully understood. During the judgment of the living. In the last generation of men. To the people. Designed by God. To be translated to heaven. Without seeing death. And this is the very message. That we are introducing. To all our fellow shepherds rod believer. Since you are shepherds rod believer. There is no reason for you. That you will not listen to this message because our message is strictly taken from the shepherd's rod. I remember, I remember this uh, statement in um, 2SR on page by which page 245, 2SR it says, If the praises which they proclaim with their lips were also in their hearts, they would have gladly accepted the good news and made all possible preparation for the most glorious event in all history. But as they refused to be interested, they ridiculed and flatly rejected it all, showing their true character and thus marking themselves as goats. 2SR page 245 So there are many people who proclaim praises only with their lips but not deep down into their hearts. Because if that praises that we proclaim in our lips that is deep down in our hearts, then you will be you will gladly accept the good news and made all possible preparation for the most glorious event in all history of all the history of the church. According to 2SR page 242, it says here, in 2SR page 242, it would have been unreasonable and injustice to the chosen people of God if he should have left them in darkness concerning the time of the most important event of all church history, the coming of Christ. What coming of Christ? It says, that part of the long prophetic period of the 2,300 days or years of Daniel 8.14. What coming mentioned in Daniel 8 verse 14? By which according to that reading, it is unreasonable and injustice to the chosen people of God if God would let them in darkness concerning the time of the most important event of all church history, the coming of Christ brought to view in Daniel 8.14. What coming is that? To SR page 184, it says, The coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8 verse 14. What is the coming of Christ mentioned in Daniel 8 14? The coming of Christ into the most holy place. And that is why the shepherd says that if God revealed the commencement of the judgment that pertains to the dead, then there is no reason that God would not reveal the commencement of the judgment that pertains to the living. And such revelation is called by inspiration as the heavenly summons. Now let's read to us our page 220. It says, Is there any way whereby we can determine the time of the opening of the seal and the commencement of the judgment for the living? If God so faithfully rebuilt to the living the commencement of the judgment for the dead, it cannot be possible that he would keep secret the time of the judgment for the living. If he did, we would have no present truth in the time of the last seal. What is the last seal? The seventh seal. Neither could there be justice in such secrecy nor could such judgment be legal therefore a revelation of the judgment for the living is of as great importance as the revelation of the gospel itself for the judgment blotting out the sins is the crowning act in the gospel of Christ thus we conclude that when the seal is open and the judgment for the living begins we must know it the day of atonement in its type proves the same for the Israelites were well informed of the event their duty and the consequence that is a guarantee God would not begin the atonement for the living without telling them that their cases in the heavenly sanctuary are now on trial 
And that is the most damaging darkness that the devil could see according to White House recruiter. I would like to read pages 31 and page 32. It says, Let us not, however, forget that there is an enemy who is determined to keep God's people in darkness in ignorance of timely truth. And what more damaging darkness could he seek to keep them in than in ignorance of that which God would have them to know? While their judgment is pending, while they are being weighed in the balances of the sanctuary, none, absolutely none. That is very plain. There is no such prophecy that the devil will counterfeit such revelation. That is one of the most important things that we need to understand. Because the sanctuary doctrine is fully protected and guarded by God. That's what it means in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. No man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth, that God allowed to open the book or even to look thereon, except the lion in the tribe of Judah. And that is Jesus Christ. What does it mean? God guaranteed that the devil cannot counterfeit such revelation. Since October 22, 1844, there is no such Sabbath keeper that counterfeited the commencement of the judgment that pertains to the dead. October 22, 1844. What they're trying to do is to destroy but not to counterfeit. If there is even one who will say that 2,300 years no, it was not ended in October 22, 1844. It was ended in 1845. Then that is a counterfeit. But God did not allow to avoid confusion. How much more in the judgment that pertains to the living? So the voice of inspiration says, There is no more damaging darkness that Satan could seek God's people in ignorance, in total darkness. It is concerning the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary when their cases are on trial and they have no knowledge concerning about it. The shepherds are declared clearly in track number 3 on page 54. It says, For when a person's judgment is pending, and he is unaware of the fact he will be unprepared and unable to stand when his case is investigated. That is very plain. Track number 3, page, page 54. And that is what Satan wants. That all of us will fail to obtain everlasting life. Is determined that God's people will be in darkness. The shepherds are declared clearly in 1 TG number 51. On page 5 and 6, it says, If the church is not commensurably growing and expanding, then how can she be a living church? And how can she keep up with the signs of the times and with the progress in the sanctuary above? You see, the progress in the sanctuary above. The same with the statement in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 122, it says, Are we awake to the work that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary? Are we awake to the things that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary? Ponder deeply, brothers and sisters. And would you think it is the work of the devil to inform everyone? It says here in volume 6, page 404, Brethren, to whom the truths of God's word had been opened, what part will you act in the closing scenes of this world's history? Are you awake to these solemn realities? Do you realize the grand work of preparation that is going on in heaven and on earth? Do we realize the grand work of preparation that is going on in heaven and on earth? The voice of inspiration says, We are not saved in groups here in the great controversy. And 409, 490, it says, the work of preparation is an individual work. We are not saved in groups. The work of preparation, it is an individual work. But I would like to read this statement in 4 BC 11.39 saying, They are privileged to see by faith the work that is going forward in the heavenly sanctuary. Of course, the pronoun they pointing to God's people. What a wonderful privilege to see by faith the work that is going forward in the heavenly sanctuary. And it is the work of the exceeding great horn, the instruments of the devil. In track number 4 on page 26, it says, Note that the truth and the place, not the sanctuary itself, were cast down. That is, both Christ's truth and his place in the earthly sanctuary were set aside. Do we understand the word set aside? Meaning, 
taken for granted. So that the knowledge as to his mediatorial work became obscured. The knowledge of Christ's mediatorial work had been obscured because the devil darkened their understanding. But thank God, we have been given the privilege to see by faith the work that is going forward in the heavenly sanctuary. Brothers and sisters, in Revelation 11 verse 1, there are three classes mentioned there to be judged. Temple, altar, and worshippers. According to track number 5, 109. But I would like to go directly to the worshippers. We know that that is the 144,000. I would like to read track number 5, page, track number 5 on page 110. Those who worship therein, being the living saints, who are to be measured, they can only be the 144,000. They can be only the 144,000. And according to 2SR, here in 2SR page 187, it says the true worshippers in the earthly, I do fully believe that these are the 144,000, the true worshippers, fear God and give glory to Him and worship Him that made the heaven and the earth. It says the true worshippers in the earthly who by faith look forward to the administration of the heavenly. They were looking forward to the administration of the heavenly were credited in the books of heaven as worthy of life eternal. To us are page 187. And this is the very message that we are now introducing to all our fellow beloved shepherds of believers. We love you brethren. For us, it doesn't matter. For example, you will say, we are the true movement. There is no other movement. We are the true movement. Okay, you are the true movement. For us, it is not a thought of robbery. Our only desire is to inform everyone that the work of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary is going forward that pertains to the living and it is about to be finished. And we will show to you that in this study, if you could only comprehend, you can appreciate the love of God that we are saved by His great mercy. Even when we reach the kingdom, no, we will not be brought there because we are good. The shepherd that says, it's so because God wants to vindicate His name. Let's read that statement, I think in 2TG. God would not deliver us. God would not brought us to the promised land. It's so because that we are worthy. It's so because that we are good. 2TG 46, 37. Note how clear these verses make the picture that what God does for His people, He does not because they are worthy of it, but for the sake of His own name, that He does it not before, but after. He takes them out of all countries. There's a statement says that saying, not because that they are good. Our good works? No. In the sight of God, it is just but a filthy rugs. Isaiah 64 verse 6. It is just but filthy rugs. And that is why the shepherd son says, Our good works alone, in reality, in the sight of God, it is just but a filthy rugs. It says in 1 TG 12 27, Our so-called good works alone will not lead us out of Babylon, but our understanding the truth for this time and implicitly heeding God's call will. Implicitly heeding God's call. So, brothers and sisters, I, I would like to read this reading in 1 TG 28, page 12. 1 TG 28, page 12. Indeed, the important thing is not how good or how bad we are or have been, but how susceptible and submissive to present truth we are now while it unfolds. The real burden of our prayer should be that we catch a vision of the truth that makes free if accepted as the scroll and rules. 1 TG 28, page 12. Now, I would like to illustrate, brothers and sisters, the heavenly summons with the earthly summons. For example, the summoner give you the letter coming from the judge at chamber, the summons. You receive the summons, but you did not open it. You did not read it. It is useless. How much more if you receive the summons and then burn it to fire? Still useless. And not only useless, you deprive yourself to protect your dignity. Whatever the accusation written in that summons, you forfeited your chance to show yourself. Although in this instance, in the heavenly zomons, we have nothing to justify our own lives because in the sight of God, 
our good works, nothing but filthy rags. But the only reality is that however bad we are, if we'll only hum humble ourselves and come to the sanctuary where Jesus Christ is there, He promised that He will be our advocator, that not even one that will come to Him will lose. All our cases will be win victoriously together with Him. What we need is just to respond to the summons, come to the sanctuary, confess our sin to secure our lives. We will continue this subject and the next episode, we will now begin to open the letter, the heavenly summons. We just inform you that there is heavenly summons. It's up to you if you will open and read the summons, open the envelope, then begin to read so that you could understand what God the Father wants us to know, by which the devil wants us to reject. Thank you very much. May the good Lord bless you and have a beautiful, wonderful evening.